in my scholarship. The paper I'm presenting today is, um, is published and it's published in Sociology Teaching. And it talks about um, teaching in an undergraduate um, uh, an undergraduate module in sociology. And so we often speak about turning our teaching into scholarship. And so this is one example uh, where I've kind of used this and there's a follow-up article to this, which has just been published in Social Justice, Citizenship and Equality. Um, so um, my, my topic for today is called a gay agenda. And a gay agenda is that my it's in inverted commas, and I'll tell you how that emerged as a title for this for this presentation. So you're going to forgive me my slides. Um, each slide somehow is animated, and each line is going to come in one at a time. I tried everything to remove it. I didn't know how to do it, but I, I'm sure I'll work it out as I go on. But um, so this uh, this auction presentation, I will focus on the module, the purpose, the goals, and the structure that I've, I've taught about, a brief background on anti-oppressive context of higher education in South Africa and Stellenbosch University. Um, I'm then going to present an analysis of the findings, including references to the classroom pedagogy, the interactions and critical incidents, and the reflections with directions for pedagogies that advance liberatory teaching and learning in the area of anti-heterosexism education and teaching at Stellenbosch and in South Africa. So let me quickly tell you about this module that I've taught. It's a first year module. It's called, it has a, a, the most unfortunate name of Sociology 144. So that's the bland course number, but it's, a, it's about a module I've taught every year since 2017. I arrived at this university at Stellenbosch in 2017, and um, uh, it says the slides are not being displayed. Yes, we are actually not seeing them. If we can, if you can just maybe close them and share okay. them again. Okay, I will. I will do that. And thanks, Gareth, for um, spotting that. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Can you see the slides now? Yes, and may I also just ask our colleagues to mute your mics if you're not speaking. Thank you. OK, can you see my slides now? Yes, thanks. OK, great. Great, so um, uh, the module is a module I've taught every year since 2017. I joined Stellenbosch University in 2017. It focuses on my teaching as a queer, non-binary man of color of a module that troubles compulsory heterosexuality in higher education. I just want to clarify what compulsory heterosexuality quickly means. And, and I, I'm going to share something about our curriculum at Stellenbosch University. Our curriculum, one could argue, is pretty much about being men. It's about men dominant. There's a uh, a high focus on whiteness and what does it mean to, do, mean to be white or compulsory white. It also would talk to us how to be, tells us how to be Christian. So our curriculum is largely powerful in that direction. But our curriculum is also about how to be heterosexual. So since my, 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 uh, my arrival at the Stellenbosch University, I've come up with two courses that I teach. One is Troubling Compulsory Heterosexuality that's an undergraduate course. And then I also teach a master's module. And I teach a, a, a postgraduate module, which is called how, how to do queer. And I suppose one could introduce a course like that, how to do black or how to do, how to be women or how to be Muslim at Stellenbosch University. And so you can see a kind of normative in our curriculum and as you, you know, track about who the writers we use, what we draw, what positions we draw, that will tell us about the compulsory aspect of our courses. So many of our modules will tell our students how to be pretty much cis-normative, that means be uh, the gender you were assigned to at birth or to be heterosexual. So it's part of a sociology first year undergraduate program at Stellenbosch University. 
It is an elective, but compulsory for students who intend to major in sociology and social anthropology. It also draws on students from other faculties and disciplines such as sports science and occupational therapy. Now, the lecture happens in room um, 220, which I think seats about 300, 300 students. Um, despite the module being sometimes on a Tuesday at four o'clock to five o'clock, the attendance to this module over the over the years I've taught it in person has kind of seen 115 to 120% attendance, which means that the auditorium is full, but students also sitting um, in um, on the on the aisles, because what the module has done is students attending the course have invited other queer students from law, from biology, from um, um, occupational therapy. So it's kind of you've got students from biology and students from biology or questions, for instance, questions around essentialism and and sex versus gender. Students from law will come with questions about civil unions. And um, so, so the course has been fairly organic in that way is that we've had mainly sociology and social anthropology students and students from the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, but we've also had students from the rest of the university. We've also had professors join the course and I, I recall Peter you know, Marking, one of the professors who submitted, including the assignments to the course. So that's been quite exciting and interesting who the, the audience of this module has been. Uh, module has been. Very few students who have come to Stellenbosch or in our higher education have had any personal exposure, explicitly or otherwise, that has prioritized gender and sexuality diversity. We think about our education systems at school, uh, topics around counter normative genders and sexualities are fairly erased from curriculum. And the same can be said about university curriculums too. Many are drawn from schools where compulsory heterosexuality and heteronormativity is institutionalized and normalized. Now, the majority of students registered for the module are white, 54%, women, 78%, and have indicated English at 57%, Afrikaans at 36% as their first, uh, as their first language. I give you this data because, uh, and I'm not going to spend too much on my theoretical um, positioning around this, um, but my theoretical positioning, and I will uh, refer to students as a white man or a African woman, um, because my work is informed by intersectionality. We, we don't live in vacuous kind of silos. Uh, we constantly navigating race, gender, our sexuality and class as we make sense of our social spaces. The majority of students, oh, I, I, did do, I do that slide. I want to put this slide up here, and this slide kind of resonates from our, 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 our from our rectorate right to our faculties, and it's it talks about offering a transformative student experience. And these are the words and kind of the 2040 strategy university and the faculties kind of ban these these kind of um, out, outcomes um, to us all. So maybe in today's presentation is to hold this slide in our, at the back of our minds to provide a unique student experience through opportunities for engagement and development through a first class academic offering, which prepares graduates to lead and excel in a diverse world. I love this outcome because it's one of the outcomes that truly integrates the intellectual and the social project and brings it very cogently to remind us what our work at universities is all about. So let me go quickly to the background of this. The South Africa, you all know, is a world leader in how gender and sexual, sexual orientation is reflected constitutionally and legislatively. You know that South Africa was the first country in the world to, to include in our constitution gender and sexuality diversity, and is currently one of six countries in the world that has it in its constitution. Now, if we bear that in mind, although South African higher education are sources of much scholarship on diversity, we talk a lot about race, we talk a lot about feminism and gender, we've been fairly quieted on same-sex sexualities. And so as we go through today's presentation, I wanna kind of flag that a little bit more. So I want us to think a little bit about what this means. 
perhaps we think in higher education that heteronormative related abuse and violence are reduced to communities outside of our universities and that universities themselves. So what I want to remind us is that universities themselves are also sites of marginalization and exclusion. So I want us to think about how the discourses and the practice that circulate within the university space are part of the broader society. And the discourses or lack of that. So in other words, if we silence issues around sexualities and uh, gender, then we've got to take responsibility for how those are silenced in our society. So I want to show you that kind of link between higher education and our, our community and societal spaces. So taking this relationship into consideration, the significance of how anti-heterosexism is dealt with in higher education requires all of our, our attention. So I want to quickly talk about oppression in higher education and higher education institutions. Now they need to, to tell our audience today, we've been notorious for high levels of oppression. Uh, I mean, my previous work, I was the Dean at the University of the Free State before I arrived at Stellenbosch. It was the time of the rates incident so, so there's a notoriety around our racism, our sexism, our rape culture, our homophobia. At Stellenbosch University, I mean, the Leicester video documents students and staff's experience of racism at SU. It's an important documentary because it shows harrowingly how students talk about their feelings, about being black, and the consequential internalized racism, the damage racism does to, to not only uh, white people, because racism affects everyone, but also how it's internalized by black students. A recent study by Lena Kamananga uh, in 2020 highlights, and I, and I picked this out from, from the thesis, how black students are ignored, alienated, and erased the experience of students of color. In 2019, just at the time of um, when this lecture started, I remember Stellenbosch University having to deal with the uh, colored women article that kind of hit the university and the, 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 the higher education space in the country. Of course, the student movements also highlighted the kind of very oppressive uh, aspects, but also drew attention to the intersectionality around ableism, racism, sexism, and how our particular minority students were experienced in the university. Of course, the last study I want to just draw attention to is a study in sociology where the student argues, it's a master's study and argues how the university has negated the diversity in experiences and has privileged its Afrikaans historical kind of trope. And so these are, these are empirical work that have been produced over the last couple of years. I want to talk quickly about heterosexism higher education in, at Stellenbosch University. And, um, and I've, um, you know, there's quite a few scholars who have spoken about higher education and queer students. For instance, the study by Monyuki and Vincent from Rhodes University, you know, this one participant writes, uh, talks about, I hate having to wake up every morning and feel like I'm fighting a battle. Can you imagine the kind of, the kind of emotional distress that queer students might have to feel that they're having to go to university. But look at the metaphor of wanting to fight a battle. Rob Patman and uh, Megan Robertson's work on sparkling tells us of one of the very sexist and heteronormative processes of how these, um, these kind of orientation games um, privilege white men and women but also position men as, um, you know, kind of chases of women and women as these docile subjects to be picked almost in these sparkling kind of games. When one of the men in that same focus group by Rob Patman, when Rob Patman asked, uh, Rob Patman is a colleague of mine in, in, my, in sociology, asked one of the, the men, you know, why don't men sparkle? And notice what this one man participant from Stellenbosch University, University says about same-sex sexuality. That's not how nature worked. Um, Professor Lesh from psychology, uh, writing about the experience of same-sex students, whilst Professor Lesh provides a very balanced account of positives and negatives, 
I want to draw this one particular attention of the lingering homophobia, resentment, strange looks that the queer students experience at the university. In an earlier study by Graziano, uh, one of the participants at Stellenbosch University talks about it was hell on earth. I only lasted one year because I didn't feel welcome and was afraid for my life. I picked up these uh, studies just to kind of give us a context that Stellenbosch University is not beyond reproach around our homophobia and our transphobia. Of course, in 2010, this precedes me. And when I did some archival research for my previous book, uh, there was a front page photo in a Stellenbosch University student newspaper but reading the very offensive comments that um, it, it was a photograph of a, a gay couple kissing and how students were triggered, describing it as offensive and even disgusting. And I just want us to remember the word disgusting because a big part of my work today is using the work of Sarah ah Ahmed, who talks about affect emotion, power, and knowledge. And, and that's what is my theoretical uh, frame of how I think about the work that I'm presenting. But I want you to just pick up on the word of disgusting and think about which bodies attract the words like disgusting, which bodies attract the words like fear. So we never put that word with heterosexuals, for instance. We never fear heterosexual people. But think about how black bodies and queer bodies very easily labeled around words, emotively um, offensive words like disgust, fear, and, and other not so kind words. So um, uh, I went to that slide. Um, I just want to go to my next slide. There we go. But at the same time, whilst I drew attention to all of these um, these uh, comments and these studies, there's also a groundswell of development and support that addresses heterosexism at Stellenbosch University. I mean, Queer Us is a student-led Queer Straight Alliance at the university, which supports to queer students at the university. Um, and that's a very positive line. In 2019, the university also appointed the first openly gay chancellor. And what a significant appointment and how that would bode for students who are kind of normative and staff who are kind of normative too. The university also hosted a five-month installation to recognize and honor the life of Simon Nkwadi, an anti-apartheid gay HIV activist. We've also seen queer seminars, we've seen reading groups thrive, particularly in the Faculty of Social Sciences, and look at today, we have an auction lecture where we are talking about issues around gender and sexuality diversity. So, so this is, you know, there, there is a groundswell of support that's also emerging in, in the presentation. So today, I'm going to be talking about uh, three themes. And I'm going to be talking about the three themes that talk about, uh, that emerged from this, um, from this paper that I'm going to speak about. So now I'm going to go to my teaching and I'm going to kind of present to you what emerged from um, what emerged from the, the um, teaching of this module. So very early in the module, a pedagogical conflict erupted when a white man student questioned the relevance of the module, suggesting that the module had a gay agenda Hence, this is where the title of this paper comes from. He questioned, and he questioned me, whether the module would in fact also trouble homosexuality. Remember, the module was called Troubling heteros Compulsory Heterosexuality. Of course, this followed, you know, following titters of laughter from those around him, another white man student seated in the same row seized the moment and followed up by questioning, what if homosexuality was given such attention? What would prevent me from introducing topics on bestiality or necrophilia in subsequent sociology modules? So rather than react to dismiss hurtful comments that associate same-sex sexualities with necrophilia and bestiality, I had to backpedal to the social construction of gender and sexuality and open dialogue as to where and how those hurtful and offensive comments were first learned. So I do not want the reference to the gay agenda to slip because there were many other comments and questions connected to feelings 
of suspicion related to the curriculum content. The reference, no doubt, is discriminatory, but it also casts dispersions about me as a queer man of color entrusted with authoritative power as a teacher. So can you see the questions here? Here's a professor, a brown professor in front of this class. And the questioning of what would I now do next if I can introduce this? And can you see, sense the questions of doubt? But also the big part of what I say is there is aspersions that I might be biased and irresponsible in determining the curriculum content for the module. Now, not only is this mischievously discriminatory, it is also, as Osterich puts it, to be accused of pushing my agenda, recruiting of my, for my people, or favoring gays and lesbians in the class. Now, notice we already have a compulsory heterosexuality every day, but students never talk about how that is favored every day. Not that this course favored gays and lesbians. It opened up a conversation about the invisibility or the erasure of these identities. So expressing feelings of concern for the module's focus, the students were quick to argue that heterosexuality was in fact under attack. I wanted to know how I was going to address that injustice. So get it everyone, a kind of reverse oppression unfolding in front of us. So segueing from the students' comments on the gay gender, a black queer woman, student from the other end of the lecture hall, responded before I had a chance. Clearly upset, she asked the white men students and those around them to stop and be careful about what they were saying. Explaining her experience as a queer woman, she said she grew up hearing similar misogynist vitriol and did not expect to hear the same in an institution of higher learning. Echoing the queer student's concerns, another white woman student with same-sex experience felt stunned by the fact that the man student equated same-sex sexuality with bestiality, bestiality and necrophilia and wanted to know where he had learned such misinformation. Another mentioned how those comments made her blood boil, and there were many others who expressed how triggering these comments were. Given my earlier discussion of safety, and classroom safety, this instance highlights how fragile the construct of safe university classroom space is, but also how volatile a classroom context focusing on sexuality can actually be. Oppressive comments such as those mentioned by the white men students can be devastating to queer students. Many queer students, like the black queer woman I quoted, have been socialized hearing such wounding rhetoric and some have even internalized these heterosexist views. How does the teacher, in this case, the professor, navigate a potentially calamitous classroom context? Interrupting any further dialogue, and notice at this stage, the classroom was poised, as one of the students said, as a blood boil. I asked the students to pause and reflect on what had just happened and write down a sentence or two of what they were feeling and why. This all comes to my work around the relationality of emotion and the work of Sarah Ahmed. In processing what students had written, a white woman seated close to the white men who started the original string of questions was quick to respond, in, respond and wanted to know why the black queer woman was so angry and if she could tone down her anger which was upsetting her and those around her. Noticing the nods of agreement around her, I observed that it seemed as though the homophobic comments by the two white men students were insignificant in comparison to the queer student's response. The crucial question here is, how does one work with a classroom context that seeks to hear out our shared oppressive knowledges on the one hand, without reifying and vilifying hurtful homophobic comments on the other. These oppressive knowledges are not simply feelings that are gener generated inside an individual, but remain within. Instead, they emerge to affect surrounding people and spaces. Anger, for example, was present in the room before the black queer student challenged 
homophobic comments. Now, both white men's students express this in the form of their negative, dismissive, and disagreeable feelings towards a curriculum that was set up to trouble oppressive structures and practices. In the context of anti heterosexist education, anger manifests through the expression of deeply felt beliefs, usually in the form of hatred and disgust, in brackets, bestiality and necrophilia, towards same sex sexualities. While offensive, these expressions are productive in the sense that they allow for the expression of deep-seated feelings and beliefs that are tied to early learning about gender and sexuality, counter-normative people. The expression of anger in this context, therefore, is not something in the same form of a disruptive, violent outburst. The anger and rage expressed here a love for the exposure of deep-seated, oppressive, effective knowledges that can be potentially transformed or unlearned. And that's what I want to think our university is all about, is that we all come with oppressive knowledges. How does the university create a space for learning, but also deep unlearning? The first question that emerges here is, how do we create a pedagogical space that views anger not as disruptive, but as Ahmed phrases it, a call for action. At the same time, one cannot miss, just checking the time, one cannot miss, um, as it is evident from the classroom interaction, the effect is interpreted differently depending on who seems to be normative and validated. Uh, so who gets to be angry and why? Notice how the two white men can be angry which seems normative and validated, but the black queer woman's expression of anger seems out of line and needs to be toned down. For queers, the expression of emotion, emotions such as anger or rage are undermined and dismissed because in some sense there is the belief that they deserve the hatred directed at them because they are not normal. Getting queers to tone down their expression therefore is one strategy to maintain the power of heterosexual dominance. It discourages any new knowledge from surfacing or being shared, thus limiting any possibility of justice or equality in the interaction, thereby maintaining the vulnerabilities and realities of queer people and other minorities as insignificant. At the same time, bracketing queers with disgust and shame pedagogically represses anyone who might challenge the misinformation and stereotypes and therefore silencing and discouraging them from public participation. What this does is expose how heterosexual privilege and social power show up in the classroom at Stellenbosch University. The next theme I want to talk about, and I don't think I'm going to cover all themes, but the next theme I do want to pick up is, especially around my inter sectionality is one of the themes called feeling religious. At a subsequent lecture, when discussing the class assessment, a white woman student asked me if she can draw in other more relevant sources. Given the abundant reading list I had provided on South African schooling and sexualities, I asked her more about additional sources. She responded that she wanted to draw on the Bible because it offered her a perspective more in line with her own beliefs and how she felt about same-sex sexualities. Silently, astounded by this response, because I'm not aware of students asking to cite the Bible in other sociology modules, for instance, in the sociology of work or the sociology of the military. But notice the Bible was invoked in this course. But I consented. So you might be asking why. First, because the text, the Bible, was relevant to the student. Moreover, I wanted to move beyond a professor-centric curriculum to discourage cookie-cutter assignments, and most importantly, to risk the kind of normative knowledge the module intended to trouble. Many other student, Christian students throughout the module expressed similar passionate positions and arguments. For example, listen to this. One student in a discussion of whether sex education curriculum should be LGBTQ inclusive 
inquired to me quite, quite proudly whether his youth pastor could be invited to offer a lecture as he was very well versed in the Bible and knew all the arguments for why South African schools should not adopt an LGBTQ inclusive curriculum. Now, while his suggestion seems to offer another perspective, you think about it, it was passively confrontational in that the student, neither a priest, no accepted that I was able to do this competently myself. Another student argued that while gays have rights and other equal freedoms, he as a Christian had the right to follow his own values and not to agree with homosexuality, which in his eyes was a sin. For him, he was being marginalized in having to study a module that was disagreeable to his morals and religion. Invoking his marginalization as a Christian, he suggested that he too was victimized and disadvantaged and that the teaching of top topics such as homophobia created other inequalities and social injustices. The student's argument, now think about it, is tried. And he would have been more accurate about being discriminated against and marginalized if he had said, I was refusing to teach him and others because they were Christian, which was clearly not the case. In their appropriating the language of injustice and so-called reverse discrimination, notice how quickly dominants construct themselves as oppressed or under attack, not only to undermine the aim of the module, but to show that power of normativity remains untroubled. Articulating false equivalents, don't you love that false equivalents, combined with furious passion, is intended to derail any discussion meant to address inequality while positioning heterosexuality as being above reproach. What the student was challenging was not his discrimination as a Christian, but that the sociology program SU was offering a module beyond a normative compulsory heterosexuality curriculum. Let that sink in for a moment. For example, would the same or any student use their Christian moral to object to teaching content on black people, Muslims, or women? Not only does Christianity serve to legitimize the power of heterosexuality in this context by the students, but it also produces power in the classroom through defining and establishing particular truths, truths as authoritative discourses, it sustains inequality to refine what is socially normative. More specifically, it reveals not only the counter normative sexualities are bad, wrong, sinful, disgusting, and abnormal, but they do not deserve attention in a university cl classroom. And more specifically, at Stellenbosch, in a Stellenbosch university classroom. There are no easy answers, but one way out of this deadlock critical conversation is to acknowledge the evangelical evangelical moral outrage in the class, and to open up a discussion of religion and its text as authoritative and a powerful socializer of unequal power relations. Stellenbosch University's historical commitment to an Afrikaans and Christian character, together with, with its complicated relationship with gender, race, and sexuality, surfaced frequently during my teaching. Stella Inyansi, an anthropologist, from Uganda described Stellenbosch when she visited as a very conservative Christian and closed against queer spaces in its midst. This conservative Christian character also continues its dominance, dominance with its hypernormative discourses and practices in teaching and learning. My colleague from the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, uh, Almarie Costendius and Alexandra, in, a, in an article published in 2020, they write about teaching a course on visual arts at Stellenbosch University. And they wrote about how the Christian beliefs of their students came up in a critical citizenship education course they taught, even though the course design was not based on any specific religion. A student, one of the students of the course, mentioned that she often thinks that she should help someone in order to go to heaven because God wants society to help others. The number of churches and active religious societies and organizations within SU at the town 
also signals the pervasiveness of the Christian normativity and privilege. Christian conservatism has deep roots in Santa Monica, which is reflective in how much more time and emotional labor Christian students took up of my time. The patterns of Christian hegemony shown here are consistent with research completed elsewhere that highlights how students who are members of Christian conservative Christian denominations demonstrate high levels of homophobia. As a way to get students to move beyond this view and also to connect the dots between Christian hegemony and homophobia, I asked students to examine the connection between the ways proponents of apartheid used Christian national framework to denigrate interracial sexual relationships, highlighting metaphors such as the Immorality Act and drawing on examples of how racial separation was justified by reference to biblical scriptures. I show how Christianity and by its implication, the invocation of the Bible was used to defend racist positions. In fact, any view that was inconsistent with the Christian national framework was deemed unnatural. Notice the same tropes, abnormal, sinful, and immoral, immoral. Think about the Immorality Act. Needless to say, the teaching supports a framework for encouraging students to explore and understand how religions such as Christianity and their texts also promote a social justice perspective, one that builds on the effect of love, learning, and self-determination. Think, for example, how religious institutions, including Christianity, have played a critical role in the political and social transformation of South Africa through forums such as the Truth and Reconciliation Com Commission, civic education, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu's fight against heterosexism in South Africa, calling it a different form of apartheid. Karen, I just want to check in with you. How am I doing for time? Dennis, I think your time is more or less up, I'm afraid to say. Um, Good. Wait, I, let's give I, him I six rather... more minutes. <laughs> so we've got you, in and then... Okay. Yes, okay. let me start you... the chat okay. at 13.30. I, can okay. I go for six minutes? Okay. So given the modules focused on everyday examples, I wanted to connect to understand students' everyday life, everyday example of homophobia. Many students chose to stay away within their, stay within their comfort zones, avoiding class discussions that focused on critical self-reflection of heterosexism. In their immediate context, often they would side, sidestep the prevalence of interpersonal heterosexism. Students opted to talk about the number of queer people they know, or that homophobia was not a thing as in previous generations. For example, at one lecture, a white woman student boasted, my best friends are gay and I just love them. And to put the cherry on the top, and I even know someone who is trans. Students in many instances simply downplayed the idea that homophobia and transphobia featured in their personal spheres, arguing that as humans, we need to be more tolerant. We should all accept each other and get along. The point I want to emphasize here is that fo focusing on treating everyone as humans, being more tolerant or being friends with gays, the students not only dismiss heterosexism as a system of structural power and privilege, they also deny the everyday practices that maintain the power of heterosexuality. Also, while best friends, acceptance and tolerance seems to suggest more positive attitudes, it is those who are gender and sexuality counter-normative who must be accepted and tolerated. Can you imagine, gays and lesbians or people who are transgender never have to say we have to tolerate heterosexuals. Heterosexuals are always the norm. They have to do the tolerating and the acceptance. As Zemblis recognizes, dominance or norm normative students might find it hard or even impossible to see how the norm with its associated privileges might marginalize others or how that norm has positioned them. There were few acceptances. In instances where students were forthcoming, they highlighted the pain, anguish, and self-hate associated with homophobic practice. A student who attended a township school, for example, spoke about attitudes of disgust expressed towards a lesbian learner. An African woman student spoke about how she could not take a same-sex partner to a metric dance because the school management and teachers discouraged her from doing so. A white man student spoke about his experience of being shunned by other boys for doing home economics. And another African man student wrote about a teacher 
who publicly berated him and humiliated him for playing netball. These narratives underline the heteronormative power, privilege, and marginalization, and how these are also viewed with feelings of resentment and shame. I'll stop there because I really want to hear your questions, and I would like to engage with some of my colleagues around what I just presented. So I, I, the paper is published, and you can have access to it, but I'd love to hear you and some of the questions you might have for me. Dennis, thank you very, very much for a thought-provoking and really incisive discussion about the, the work you do and the work you publish on. I think on a, on a macro level, you showed us really, um, you illustrated what you said right at the beginning with regard to the SU um, approach, how to integrate the intellectual and the social in teaching and learning. And on a more micro level, um, to me, you showed us the importance of opening up conversations about and by um, marginalized invisible groups and how one should create safe spaces for such conversations in a classroom context. There is, of course, a lot more I could say, but thank you very much for all the opening up of spaces that have previously been closed to us, not only in doing, but also in, in talking. So over to our colleagues um, in this session. Are there any questions, any comments? There's a lot of praise in the chat. Yes, Gerda. Thank you so much, uh, Dennis. I'm really moving. What I, I, I want to know more about, and you did discuss it, if you can maybe just unpack it a bit more, that point that Karen just made about the safe space. The examples you mentioned also dealt with anger and, and less of a safe space. Um, so, if we find ourselves in a classroom and we used to wanting a safe space, but it isn't one, can you please help us unpack the way you addressed it that day that, you know, when, when that um, bestiality comment came up, you turned the safe space into a learning space. Please help us understand how to do that. Yes. Great, thank you. Um, uh, so, so my character, my, my, my training and my work is, uh, whilst my doctoral work is in sociology, I've also been in education um, for a long period of time. And my master's work and my, um, my other graduate work in, in education has been about teaching contention or um, addressing or working with anti-oppressive anti -oppressive education. And a lot of that work draws on anti-apartheid activists' work, uh, the civil rights movement, the queer movement, and how to engage and to talk about issues of oppression with both dominance and subordinates. So when one goes into the classroom, one has to know that when, when we're gonna open these conversations of, cont of content, students are gonna come with their own learnings. The learnings that come into the space and, and that, that come in will be offensive and, and there has to be room for that. Because if we truly want to create a space where we want to openly engage with these conversations for transformation and liberation, then we have to, you know, the truth will set us free. And it's it's a wonderful as as um uh, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful line because. Once that comes into the room, one can then engage. But the point that one has to work with is that we can't beat up our students. And at no way in my lecture with a young girl asked me to bring the Bible, the boys talked about bestiality, my reaction to those students cannot be anger. Like you and like me, we've all learned offensive and oppressive stuff. The great part is that we're in a space that we can trouble that oppressive stuff, that we can confront ourselves and all that stuff. But remember, a lot of our racism and our homophobia, we've learned it from people we love, from our grandparents, from our parents, from teachers we respect and we love. 
We hold those to those thoughts because we've learned that. So when we talk about troubling something, to trouble means to unlearn that, to open it up. Now you asked me a very specific question about how do we create safe spaces? So anti-oppressive education, there has to be some engagement with working with pedagogy. How the teacher and students can be enabled to be in a space where you know this contention is going to come, but that you need to trust that you have a pedagogy that's going to help all the students to navigate that space. Safety becomes an in inverted commas here because you can never assure that. But the idea is that setting guidelines that, you know, whilst we might be in a large class, we need to hear each other out. There has to be some aspect of respect. And, you know, the, the idea of putting to trouble knowledge is to trouble the knowledge we come with. And for some, it's a very difficult process. Um, but the, night, the positive thing about that is in the classroom, you also have people who are allies, who are queer. And I also teach a module on race and racism, for instance. So, you know, the tensions around race and racism, our students have all learned that. So what opportunities or what uh, learning spaces do we create at the university to trouble those learnings. So the idea is safe becomes a nebulous word because things are never truly gonna be safe. But the teacher, the facilitator needs to work from the assumption. Like the student has learned that stuff, they can also unlearn that stuff. And that's the positive thing we need to take from this. That our students are not bad people. They've just learned some stuff. Thank you very much. Um, then there's also a question from Jody Lempane in the chat, asking what your thoughts are on schools in the Western Cape allowing students to self-identify or to select their pronouns. Yeah, yeah I think I think I think it's important. Um, remember, when we talk about gender, gender is not something that is inherent. We're not born with gender. Gender is given to us. It's 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 imposed on us when we're growing up. When you think about somebody who was born and has a penis, or somebody who was born and has a vagina, we give meanings to a penis and vagina. We give colors to that child. That child doesn't choose those things. We are we are we are doctored in such a way that we need to gender this body in oppressive ways as well. So young girls. You need to do certain things, certain roles that we give young girls. Our schooling, we contain girls in particular ways. So the fact that girls and or, or, or bodies in schools can say, I identify or my identity and my gender expression is in a particular way. It's It enables young people to have some agency and, um, and ownership of their bodies. And, and that can be liberating. I think when young people are asking that, they're asking us to say, you've imposed gender on me. That's not how I want to express myself. All we can do is open dialogue for that. And when, we, when, when somebody's asked to be gendered in a particular way, and when somebody, you, you want to open that space for engagement. The Western Cape, unlike the rest of South Africa, has actually come up with the first guidelines in South Africa on gender and sexuality, where young people, where young people are transgender, um, are, are registered in schools, and are able to express themselves and, and identify in in, gen, in in their in the ways that gender is most appropriate for them. But ultimately, what I want to say is to the audience today is that gender is an institution. Gender is been has been imposed on us. But gender is not something we have inherently. We all do gender. We're never masculine all the time, or we're never feminine all the time. We go along with certain scripts because our institutions, our society rewards us to conforming along gender lines. Young people are maybe teaching us that we need to do the work. We need to do the gender work here because in so many ways, we've imposed gender. 
Um, so, so I, what my thoughts are, I'm, I'm feeling fairly optimistic. I'm, I'm feeling that this is, 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 it's a social justice engagement. It's not to, to not allow young people to do that would be oppressive. Thank you very much for that. Um, are there any further questions or comments? I'm just keeping my eye on the time as well. Yes, Dr. Rinquist. Hi. I just want to pose it or, or make a comment and, and ask a question maybe, but I've um, heard of a teacher that, for instance, a gay teacher, and he painted his nails like it's just a normal, not even something extreme. And so the school principal then sent him home, etc. cetera. Um, and I just want to maybe comment on how the need of, of similar to students that lecturers or teachers and learners at school, how it's important that the people assume their actual identities, if I can put it like that, and live and live your actual life because a school principal would send a teacher home because he painted his nails, which to me is extremely um, funny at this point of the whole conversation where, where you will deny um, someone his job or, or learners to learn from that person because he has paint on his nails. Maybe you can unpack that. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Rehnquist. And um, I, I published a little bit on transgender and schooling. Um, and if you if you if you drop me an email, I could send you some of the work we have pick up on some of the debates around trans issues within South Africa and particularly South African schooling. Um, but but it's such an important point that you're raising. And let's let's just let's unpack that. When a teacher comes in with nail polish on his hands, or, or on their hands, I don't know what their gender would be. Um, and when we when we when we ask that person to to leave the school, the message is explicit that people who are gender counter-normative do not belong. And that is that is a harsh thing that and that's fairly exclusionary, right? That if you paint, if you express yourself in counter uh, in gender counter normative ways, that you do not belong. And young people in school will get the same message. I want to feed in a little bit of around the costs, and I, I try not to go into this, but the cost to to think about the high levels of suicide among um gender and sexually counter-normative young people, the dropping out of school, the marginalization, the bullying, the violence that young people express in school. When we put out a message by asking that person to leave, we're saying we are legitimizing that we can be homophobic, we can be violent, that that particular social group does not belong, that that particular social group uh, should not be in schools and, and they deserve or they merit whatever happens to them. So just think about the messages that young people who are gender questioning or are questioning their sexualities, and we all do, we all do that. Schools are spaces where we do our gender and sexu sexuality work. So see how that feeds into what I'm talking about today is what they're doing in that school is creating a compulsory heterosexuality but they're also creating something else. They're creating a compulsory cis normativity. That's cis normative, that there's only two genders and there's a binary, and there's masculine and there's feminine. My argument would be that gender is a construct. We give air to gender. Thank you, and that makes it very hard work. Um, for lecturers then to uh, to actually counter what was done at schools in terms of of those sexualities and and gender rising to to use that term to undo to unlearn enable in order for students to learn again and to enable themselves differently. Sure. Sure. 
Thank you. I think uh, we've got one more minute or so just for a very last question or, uh, or comment before I hand over to Gerda just to close off the proceedings for today. Genevieve, thank you. She says compulsory heterosexism and cis normativity in institution of higher learning is a fundamental human rights issue. Thank you for making visible the plight of gender and sexually diverse students, Professor Francis. Yes, indeed, and I suppose one can take it further and also make it applicable to lecturers. And there might be many of our colleagues listening or attending today who might very much associate with what you are saying. So thank you for, for yeah, I don't know how to say thank you enough for, <laughs> for making your message visible and audible to such a diverse audience and for your insight and your wisdom in this context. Thank you. Hada, over to you. Thanks, yes, Karen. I want to pick up there with a thanks to Dennis. Um, and I think it's not just, as Genevieve puts it, the plight of gender and sexually diverse students, or as Karen is adding, lecturer. But I think all of us can do with getting away from cisnormativity and, um, you know, that the paint on our fingernails or absence thereof is, is policed. And all of us can do with less binary ways of being. So I think you're making the world a better place. Thank you so much, Dennis, for sharing. Um, I have two small housekeeping things to do. The one is, please see in the chat function, I'm inviting you to join us to the next auction. That's 29 March, and we'll discuss multilingual classroom. Um, yeah, and I appreciate Mr. Mouton's contribution there in, in the chat, where he also says, the plight for many of us is to understand better. Yes, so wonderful for you to open that understanding to the affect colleague. Thank you. And then um, the, what I quickly want to do is just invite anybody who wants to pick up on this theme and discuss any possibility for, for sharing in a FIC formation, in a special focus group formation, anything to do with heterosexism or cisnormativity. If there's any interest, you can put up your hand on the MS team or you can send me an email and we'll follow up. At this stage, I'm just watching if there's any hands going up. And then, yeah, let me just conclude by, by saying what Celine is saying. Thank you so much, Prof. Francis. It was really lovely. And then thank you, Mr. Martin. I'm definitely following up with you. So colleagues, as you can see, there's at least one of us who want to pick up on this. Let's have more if you want more. And there's Cornell as well. Thanks, Cornell. And Sean, thank you. Oh, and Prof Pratika and Celine, wonderful. We're going to contact you all. So this is then formally the end of our session. Thank you so much, Dennis. Much appreciated. As I keep collecting hands, people are welcome to leave. But thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for the for hosting me and for for um, attending. Thank you. Much appreciated. You can see all the thanks in the comment. <laughs> Yes, Cornell, the recording will be available on, on email, uh, on, on our website, and I'll share it with everybody soon. Thanks.